Well, welcome everybody to the 2021 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference. I'm Mel Taylor, one of the organising committee here for, coming in from Sydney at the moment. Um, in our next uh, uh, presentation, we have Mr. Mike Myers, Mays, sorry, Mike Mays, who's going to be talking about mobile CO2 depopulation systems. Now, we're very uh, privileged to have Mike with us today. And if you're interested in his bio and abstract, you can find those on the website under speakers. A couple of housekeeping tips. Um, we have the Zoom chat function disabled for this presentation. So if you have any questions, please write those in the Q&A section and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, we encourage you to use the hashtag uh, GADMConf if you're on Twitter or other social media. And at the end of the presentation, as you leave, you'll be presented with an evaluation form and we'd appreciate that feedback. Just as a reminder, we are recording the sessions. We will be editing these and making them available in July as part of our GADMAC award ceremony and that will coincide with the, uh, the the release of the Australian Journal of Emergency Management that's going to go alongside this conference. So without further delay I'd really like to uh, welcome and invite Mike to start his presentation. So over to you Mike. Okay thank you for that introduction Mel and I will say that uh, you know Mel if I start to run long please just let me know and we'll uh, end it there. But so thank you all for uh, being here for this presentation. Uh, Again, I am Mike Mays from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And I'm going to be talking about the mobile CO2 swine depopulation system that we developed. And the first question that you might have is, why develop a system? And I can tell you from 100% assurance that we uh, never ever wanted to use this. However, there are a couple of reasons why we did uh, build this system. And first and foremost is because uh, the threat of animal diseases. And as everyone knows, African swine fever is on, you know, several countries' uh, plates right now. It's not in the United States at the moment. And uh, of course, there are other animal diseases that may affect uh, swine, such as foot and mouth disease, you know, classical swine fever, or, or other diseases that could have an impact on um, swine welfare issues. And then we, you know, with the COVID-19 coming into play here, we thought, there really could be an impact on our processing plants. So from humans being out of work with the virus or a complete plant shutdown, and if that were to happen, you know, animal agriculture does not stop. So with the threat of animal diseases and the impacts from COVID-19, we really felt the need to have a uh, depopulation system in play very quickly uh, due to that North Carolina is a, has a large population of swine. At any given time, it's around 9.2 million head of swine in the state. So here's an overview of our system, okay? So our system uses modified shipping containers, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. I'll show you some pictures. And these containers do have doors on both ends, and those are our depopulation chambers. We do use a vaporizer to furnish the CO2 to the uh, depopulation chambers. But we do have to use the, um, the chambers, I mean, introduce the CO2 in accordance with the American Veterinary Medical Association guidelines on humane euthanasia. Finally, the system uses conveyors, and I'll show you those pictures in just a moment, to immediately unload the carcasses into disposal vehicles. So now while we were in the midst of building this system, and I like to always say that we were building the aircraft while we were flying in it, literally. So uh, here's our considerations that we looked at. Number one is throughput capacity. Again, 9.1 or 9.2 million head of swine in North Carolina. Other states such as uh, Iowa and Minnesota have uh, similar or lots more. I think uh, Iowa's up to 20 million head of swine. So we had to look at throughput capacity because if there is a, a very broad disaster, then you know, we wanted to be able to respond effectively. Also, we wanted to have uh, ease in loading and unloading. When you talk about market weight pigs, you know, anywhere from uh, 260 to 280 pounds, which I think kg is what, 113 or something like that, we wanted to make sure that uh, our workers weren't trying to, you know, pull one pig at a time. So we had to look at ease in loading and unloading. Thirdly, we wanted to look at mobility. So if it was an animal disease event, you know, could we go on farm, depopulate, clean and disinfect the system, and then go to another farm? 
And then finally, we wanted to make sure that we had safe operations because at the end of the day, we wanted to ensure everyone went home just the way they came to work that day. So we never compromised on safety. So here's our operational concept, <clears throat> excuse me. So we took the original idea of a shipping container. And this is not one of our containers. This is just a picture from our good friend Google. With do and again, with doors on both ends, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. So we transload the pigs from the live haul trailer into the container. So that's the basic concept, right? But we also wanted to have the ability to unload both the top and bottom decks of the trailer. Here in the USA, we have uh, our live haul trailers to haul pigs, and a lot of them are double deckers, as they are in many other countries. Some of our trailers are triple deckers, but most are the double deckers, as you see here, <clears throat> upper deck and a lower deck. So now keep in mind that one live haul trailer can carry up to 200 market weight pigs. So anywhere from uh, 260 to 280 pounds. And if my conversions are wrong, someone please let me know. So now one trailer requires two containers to accept the full load of pigs. So top deck in one container, and then the bottom deck in the other container. Now this is one of our original designs, okay? Translating the pigs into the depop container. And notice how the container is actually sitting on the ground. Since that picture was taken, we have <clears throat> converted all of them. They sit on their own chassis, and that makes them um, perfect for mobility. It does require a prime mover, you know, becomes a tractor and trailer unit at that point, but they are mobile now. Here's one of our earlier designs with a, uh, our Depop uh, container here. And you can see now they have doors on both ends. And in the distance, you'll notice there is no gate. The gate was just removed and the picture was taken, okay? The point here is, is that we wanted to have a, uh, something that when the live haul trailer backed up to it, that the pigs would not hesitate to go into. And so if there were no doors on the other end, then it would be dark and it would be uh, somewhat uh, given an environment where the pigs may not maneuver in there. Since we do have doors, and then we put the gate in place, then the pigs will run in there toward the light. Here's one of our earlier versions you can see with a uh, conveyor floor. These are independent floors. However, they can work uh, simultaneously with each other, and they can also work independently of each other, and they also work forward or reverse. Here we are testing with the 160 pound sandbags just to see how the floor would uh, uh, function properly. And the floor does work very well. And I got a short video here I want to show you. So a couple things here to notice. First, you'll see the uh, vertical sliding gate. We have since changed that to a horizontal left and right sliding gate, which makes it easier for the worker. Once the pigs are loaded, they just slide the gate from left to right and it's uh, closed at that point. Also notice here the bars on the conveyor floor. What we found out is that some of the smaller pigs, when they were euthanized and they would lie down, their legs would get caught under these bars. So the way that we overcame that was we put belts on the floors. So that quickly eliminated the, uh, the legs getting caught underneath those bars. The other thing here that I want to point out to you is this top loading chute here. So this is, allows the live haul trailer to come in and unload the top chute. Once that top deck is unloaded, workers from the outside can take this crank on the outside, it's connected to this chain here, and they will raise that to its upper position and it's out of the way. Then we can go ahead and begin the operation of euthanizing the pigs. So now I just wanna give you a synopsis of what happens when we do introduce the CO2. And again, this is not one of our units here. It's just a depiction. I just wanna give you a summary. I'm gonna show you some real pictures here in a moment. And again, one load is approximately 100 market weight hogs. So the, the larger pigs, it would be about 100, and anything smaller than that, then it would just be more. But whatever comes in on that live haul trailer on one deck, 
will also go into the container here. So now what we found out is that we can do transloading of those pigs to the container in less than seven minutes. So if it's 100 of the big pigs, less than seven minutes they can be in there. Then we have a prep time of about three minutes or less. We then introduce the CO2 and we have a dwell time of 15 minutes. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. Then we have a CO2 recovery and clear time of less than eight minutes. We have a loadout time. Once we, you know, the pigs are euthanized, we turn on the conveyor floors. We have a loadout time of about seven minutes. That gives us a total time for one load, approximately 40 minutes from the time they start loading to the last pig is unloaded. So now let's talk about the capacity of one system. And one system, as you can see here, is one vaporizer and two containers, okay? So if we take one load, and that's at least 100 market weight pigs or anything smaller, and we can do that one load in 40 minutes, that means one container can do two loads every 80 minutes, or two containers can do four loads every 80 minutes. So now if we do one operational day by the math, that gives us the uh, capacity or ability to do 30 loads. Okay, and that would equal out to about 3,000 market weight uh, pigs, okay? A total weight of 780,000 pounds. But what if we had five systems? That means in theory we could do 150 loads or 15,000 market weight pigs. And that sounds like a lot, right? And it is. And first and foremost, let me tell you that uh, we never ever want to do this. Uh, we, we built the system because there may be a need for it. But realistically, you know, even if we had all the, the five systems in play, we feel like we could do about 70%. And that just gives us room for, you know, errors to happen. You know, you've got workers. And we also don't want to deploy all of our systems at one time so we can have some redundancy. If one uh, container breaks down, then we can just put another one in place. So probably 70 to 75% of our five systems that we've built. And here's our system capabilities. We do have three vaporizing units. We have two 40 foot containers that are deep pop chambers. We have eight 45 foot containers that are deep pop chambers. We have 10 outside conveyors and six transloading chutes. And I'm gonna show you pictures of all of these. Right here, you can see th these were set up initially for a demonstration. These are the uh, container units here, and this is the outside conveyor. And that's exactly what it is. It conveys the carcasses into a disposal vehicle. Here you can see we were on a farm actually doing a depop of wean pigs. And once the uh, wean pigs come out of the container, they go to this outside conveyor, which conveys them right into a rendering vehicle. Here is a transload chute. And this transload chute is connected uh, directly to the uh, depop unit, okay? And then what happens is the live haul truck connects to this end here. The problem is the, when the live haul trailer, the height, and we built these to height. So the live haul trailer height comes to this line here. So with the conveyor floor, there's about 14 inch difference. That's the reason why we need the transload chute. Or let's say we set up six containers on one site, we could grade the area lower so that the live haul trailer could back directly up to the, the depop units there. And here you can see the uh, live haul trailer connected directly to the transloading chute. So now we did build three vaporizing systems, but why the need for a vaporizer? Well, as you know, liquid CO2 comes in bulk form and it's compressed, negative uh, 81 minus degrees and high pressure. So we bring it down to atmospheric pressure and we warm it up, thus the, re the, the need for a vaporizer. So our first one that we developed was a 500 gallon liquid propane tank vaporizer. And that's literally what it is, a liquid propane tank. And we use that to help vaporize the liquid CO2. The second one is we have a heat assisted ambient temperature vaporizer. 
And thirdly, we have an electric vaporizer, and that is just what it is, an electric unit that heats up the uh, liquid CO2. So now the uh, cost of the vaporizing units, uh, the LP tank vaporizer, about $6,000 US. The heated system ambient temperature vaporizer, about 85,000 US. And then the electric vaporizer, about 75,000 US. So now this is just a picture of the 500 gallon LP tank vaporizer with the external heaters. So the external heaters are used to help sublimate the dry ice. The liquid CO2 goes into the uh, 500 gallon LP tank. The heaters help to um, sublimate the dry ice to create the gas. Now this is a vaporizer number two. And as you can see, we have eight, in this picture, you're only gonna see four ambient temperature vaporizers. And that's just what they are. They're nothing more than tubes with fins on them to uh, have the heat exchange of the ambient temperature. Now, what we did is we mounted them. There's one, two, three, four here, and there's a rack in front of this one with another set of four. So there's a total of eight ambient temperature vaporizers in this container. But this is a heated container, so that gives us the ability, that's why we call it the heat-assisted ambient temperature vaporizer. And this one can produce a lot of CO2 vapor very quickly. The third one is we purchased two electric vaporizer from a commercial uh, manufacturer, and we mounted them in a small uh, tow behind trailer that you can tow behind with a pickup truck. And you can see the two units here. So how much CO2? Well, we know that uh, we've got to have enough to fill a depop container above the head of the animal within five minutes. Because again, we're following the American Veterinary Medical Association guidelines. And we've got to have a CO2 displacement rate of 20% every five minutes, so or every minute, 20% per minute for five minutes. So when we do the math here, you can see that a 45 foot container is going to give us about 1,350 cubic feet of CO2. And again, we only fill the container to a level above the head of the animal. However, we have to have 63% concentration. This to it is ensure we have a, a humane euthanasia process. So now the CO2 is measured. Um, we had a Venturi and manometer established with our good friends from North Carolina State University Bioengineering Department. And so our calculations have shown that when we uh, do these iterations, for the smaller pigs, it's about 150 pounds of liquid CO2. And for the larger ones, anywhere is up to 290 pounds of liquid CO2. Here is the venturi that I was talking about on the outside of our container, okay? So the vapor will come in here, go through the venturi, and then we have a manometer connected to it so we can measure the flow of CO2 to meet the guidelines that I discussed earlier. Now here's what I want you to know. We went from the drawing board April 29th, and remember this is 2020, and COVID hit uh, the U.S. sometime, well, we don't know when, but started becoming uh, much more prominent around the March time frame, which we started getting worried at that point. So April 29th is our drawing board. May 8th, we conducted our first test in 10 days. And so here's what we did. On May 8th, we did actually 64 Pigs, they were about 175 pounds, and we used a 40-foot container. It was one of our first units. Then on May 19th, we actually did 100 hogs in that 40-foot container. They were about 220 pounds. So what happened when the CO2 was introduced? So at the first minute, we noticed that there was a heightened state of alert, okay? At two minutes, there was some vocalization, and between two minutes, 30 seconds, and three minutes, there was this uh, anesthesia type effect. You know, the senses were lost and they started uh, becoming unconscious. And four to five minutes, there was no movement. There was some involuntary movement, but there was no voluntary movement. So the CO2 must be introduced in five minutes. And then we must maintain a dwell time of 10 minutes. This was again to meet the AVMA guidelines. End result, 100% effectiveness. 
So now what about actual depopulations? So we did have to do, um, like I said, wean pigs. And, and you can see there on your screen, no buyers due to the market disrupts, disruptions from the pandemic. And we only utilized one depop container and we used that right on farm. We used our LP tank vaporizer and an outside conveyor. We ended up doing about 12,000 wean pigs. It was an unfortunate situation, but those did go to rendering. And so the product was able to be utilized that way. So we did unfortunately have to do some market weight pigs. And this was again due to uh, overstock from the pandemic, okay? We utilized two Depop containers, the electric vaporizer, two loading chutes, and two outside conveyors. And we did approximately 6,000 head for those Depops. Again, the same thing. The one through five minutes, it was the exact same, our dwell time, and again, 100% effectiveness. And how do we know this? What we did is we mounted um, uh, CO2 meters so we can measure the level of CO2 going inside the container above the pig's head. And also we had cameras. We did not record, but we had cameras so that our veterinarians uh, on staff could monitor exactly what was happening and um, work with us if we needed to adjust anything. So how do we measure the CO2 levels? We did purchase 20 multi-gas meters. And again, we gotta meet the, our guidelines. And now we measure at different levels at the container. So we have portholes on the outside of the container where we plug our meters into, and we measure below the conveyor floor, just above the conveyor floor, and then anywhere from one foot to the five foot level. It just depends on the size of the uh, pig that we're doing. And again, the top meter must reach 63% of concentration. Now here's one of our actual uh, readings that we went through. And I, this is what I wanna show you. So the lower was meter number 17. Our start time was 1745. We had 63% concentration within one minute. And this is for obvious reasons, right? Because CO2 is heavier than air. It's coming in at the bottom of the container. And that's where we're measuring that. So within one minute, the lower meter is at 63%. Well, I'm gonna talk about the end time in just a moment. So our middle level meter, so it started reading at 1747, and in three minutes, we were at 63% concentration. So our upper level uh, meter right there, 1749, and then it was at 63% at 1754. And you'll notice how the end times, it was faster here on the upper level. That's because we started pulling the CO2 out after we met our dwell time. And we, it started coming down from the top meter first. Then it started coming down the second meter and then finally the third meter. So again, we took safety very seriously. We have uh, safety experts on hand with full self-contained breathing apparatus for any tests and actual events. We did purchase personal safety alarms for our workers that were operating in and around the equipment. These uh, personal alarms measured low levels of CO2. So if those alarms went off, they knew to vacate the area. And of course, we always conducted a safety briefing prior to beginning any operation, including testing. So everyone knew exactly what the uh, steps were should something happen. So we are doing or have done additional modification. And one of the things that we got done was automatic door openers because before we had automatic door openers, notice how the outside conveyor is underneath the container here. This allows the pigs, the, car, the pig carcasses to be offloaded from the inside conveyor floor to the outside conveyor. But what would have to happen is a worker would have to climb over this conveyor to open the doors and become a safety issue. And so we had our um, guys to install a uh, actuator to raise and lower the pivot gate here. So this gate pivots, and you can see there's a pin down here that workers would have to pull in order to uh, allow the gate to pivot so the carcasses could unload. And here I've got a quick video, I'll show you the automatic door openers. 
You notice they're quite heavy duty. And so you may be asking why the pivot gate here? Well, we load from the opposite end. And so when this gate is shut, then it will not allow the pigs to escape. That's the reason why we have that there. And the gate is open here. The gate would be shut once we start loading. So now the, you know, we have the automatic uh, door openers. It really eliminates that risk for someone getting hurt. Here's just our pictures of our equipment in preparation for a demonstration. And one of the things that I'll, you can see here is some of the plumbing on the outside of the units. They are quite rudimentary in the way they look, but they work very effectively. It's just the end unit uh, picture from the outside conveyor. You can see some of the controls on the sides of the unit here. We have since put hydraulic uh, wheels or wheels on these uh, conveyors that are operated by hydraulics so they can be you know, moved around the yard and stored properly. They can't be transported on the wheels, but they can be moved around quite easily. And also like to tell you that we always operate the units in pairs. And the reason for that is because you'll notice the controls on the units here. So our workers will set up a canopy or a tent, if you will, two tables, they set up the CO2 meters and our cameras are on the inside and connected to a TV monitor on the outside. So that way one crew can operate two containers. So we had all, we've got 10 of these units and we have five pairs. And so the pairs will always face each other like this. So the summary is our mobile CO2 depopulation system. It's a versatile system with many different capabilities, okay? It can be used in disasters, disease, and any other events where we may have animal welfare issues. The one thing I did not talk about during the presentation is that we can reclaim and reuse some of the CO2. If we don't reclaim the CO2, then we will run it through a back system, mix it with air, and disperse it into the atmosphere. But what we like to do is if we're gonna have a large operation where we do multiple runs, uh, one right after the other, then we will reclaim as much CO2 as possible. We can set up in multiple locations if need be. So maybe we're at a, a one farm, then we can take another system and go to another farm if need be. This would be ideal, I say ideal, but would be ideal if there was a disease event that we had to respond to. So we do have three vaporizing units. Uh, we have the electric vaporizer, the LP tank vaporizer, and the very large vaporizer. We have 10 depop containers. We have 10 of these outside conveyors. Six transloading chutes. And we do have two reclaim containers. So when we're set up, well, let's, let's just say we set up six containers on one site, we will then set up the reclaim container. And we will use a back system to pull the CO2 from the containers to push it into the reclaim container. Then when the next depop container is ready, we'll push that CO2, mix it with some uh, CO2 from our vaporizer, and then push it on into the uh, depop container. That's how we can reduce the amount of CO2 that we use. Currently, we are testing our vaporizers on uh, whole house gassing of poultry. You know, this has been done in the past. Uh, with different units, and so we're looking at our units to be able to utilize that as well. So that's my presentations. Uh, time for questions and answers. Fantastic. Thank you, Mike, for such a clear presentation. Um, and you know, you're obviously talking to an audience here that is familiar both with emergency and disaster situations as well as animal welfare considerations. So I think to uh, we all know the importance of being prepared. You know, so to have this sort of thing in place, to have those um, uh, those 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 problems um, nutted out now, and right before they're needed, is so important rather than trying to do it on the fly. So thank you so much. Um, I've got one very quick comment and a couple of questions already. And please, if you're in the audience here and you're interested in asking some questions, please write them in the Q and A. Um, Rebecca Husted is here with uh, with us in the panel area, and uh, she just wants to make a comment about um, you know how useful it is to actually see you know, see the photographs of, um, of what you've been doing um, and have such a clear presentation. 
um, and also appreciates your honesty with you know things that have worked and things that have, have been challenges. So again, I would just want to echo that as well. So I have a question here um, from one of the audience uh, asking, how do you sanitize these containers? That's a great question. So, you know, while we were going through this and, and you're right, they have to be sanitized. They have to be cleaned and disinfected because whether you, you know, in a disease event or not, they've got to be cleaned and disinfected. And so what we have done is we've taken a, uh, uh, our workers and, and they will use a, um, a high pressure washer and they will start at one end and they will shoot high pressure water from one end to the other. And so once they clean out all the, uh, the mud and the muck, if you will, then they'll run uh, uh, a disinfectant through the, uh, the unit that way using the same uh, system. Mm -hmm. And it takes quite a while because there's a lot of moving pieces in there. They have to get underneath the conveyor floor. They have to actually run the conveyor floor while they are uh, using high pressure water to get all the different nooks and crannies. And then once that's done, you know, we have not done any testing uh, as far as, you know, maybe using some surrogate as a pathogen to, to see if our uh, C and D methods work. But um, we, we will probably get to that in the future because we want to make sure that, uh, you know, our methods aren't going to, uh, you know, transmit a pathogen to another farm, you know, by no means, or a disease if we're in a disease event. Mm. Can I ask just a very quick clarification question there? So, uh, are you foreseeing in a disease situation where you might have, you know, an infectious sort of pathogen here, that these these decontamination um, units would be set up in situ, you know, on, on a farm and then sanitized and then moved to another place, or rather than have people come to a central location? Presuming that wouldn't be a smart thing to do. Yeah, that's a great question, Mel. So we have talked about it doing it both ways. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have developed so many units. Maybe we could set up a central location with six units, okay? And then we could take another two units and go to a farm and, and conduct operations there and leave two units in reserve for, you know, redundancy. And then at that point, yes, we would have to, again, clean and disinfect. Uh, and, and again, you know, taking into consideration that if we are in a disease event, there will probably be you know, a control area that we will operate in. And so, uh, as again, as we talk about ensuring that those units are cleaned and disinfected properly, we want to maintain operation for that control area first, uh, because we've got to get to the point to where we can say with 100% assurance, yes, the units are clean and disinfected properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so another question here, did you consider other gases such as nitrogen when designing your system? Absolutely, that's a great question. And when we went into this, we wanted to have our units dual purpose and our units are rated for nitrogen. We have not got to the testing phase of using nitrogen, but we wanted to do that because if there's a limitation on CO2, then the thought is we could back up and go to nitrogen. But uh, as we all know, there are nuances and uh, different characteristics with uh, nitrogen. So we haven't gotten there yet, but great question. Mm. Uh, another question, um, is it always, um, is there always a 100% death rate? Do you have someone checking for vital signs after each load? Man, someone was listening very intently. Good question. So the answer is we have had a few to make it. And so what we do is we have our veterinarians on staff. They watch the TV monitors on the outside. And they will tell our workers, hey, the dwell time may have been 10 minutes, but I see maybe one breathing. Let's keep the dwell time going so we can have 100% effectiveness. And just by happenstance, we did have one, for some unknown reason, uh, once we cleared the CO2, we started the conveying process, he popped up and uh, was walking around. So the veterinarian and staff were able to get him, and then we used the captive boat to euthanize that one animal. There's always one. Um, yeah. Are there any other species of animals that this wouldn't work so well on? You know, we've talked about that and, and our containers are large enough that, you know, could we, if need be, use them on sheep, you know, goats, or maybe even cattle. And, you know, there's a possibility there that we can. not And the reason why I say that is because the weight's not the issue. I think it's more or less the uh, dimensions of the animals. 
we had probably 21,000 pounds, so I don't know what that is in kg, but we had 21,000 pounds of swine carcasses in some of these containers, you know, once they were humanely uh, euthanized. So, you know, you can just take cattle. It would obviously be less cattle, but probably, you know, similar weights, maybe 15, 16,000 pounds. We've also looked at what is the possibility that we could take uh, poultry in cages and run those cages through there. So we've got different ideas. We want to have our equipment that could be dual purpose, but we're still looking at that, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that sounds a good idea, given the investment and the time that's spent, you know, thinking about and, and developing and designing those units. Um, Julie here says, uh, thanks for a clear and thoughtful presentation. That's really appreciated. Um, she said she missed the bit about um, the possible use of some of the carcasses in the recent depop operations. So could you say a bit more about the reuse or use? Yeah, so when we were, uh, obviously when you start any type of depopulation, you, you got to have a um, method of disposal. And so we certainly didn't want to get into this and uh, not have a method of disposal. And also too, in North Carolina, as most of you know, on the East Coast, we are, uh, especially in the Eastern part of the state, it's a, a high seasonal water table. Uh, burial is, you know, probably not going to happen just because the water tables are so high. So in our uh, iterations that we did, uh, the animals or the carcasses went to rendering. Fantastic. Um, and, and Jody here just uh, asked a question. Are there any limits or fluctuations on the equipment operation effectiveness due to ambient weather uh, temperatures and conditions? Also, how are the doors or conveyor system affected if the container isn't square or twists due to movements from either ground subsi subsiding after the placement or due to live weight movements? Yeah, great, great questions. So let me answer the second question first. So what we found is that the animal movements themselves did not, well, it only affected the doors slightly, but the, the workers were able to, you know, adjust the handles a little bit and still get them closed. And again, on the, on the end with the automatic actuators, those are only on one end. It worked just fine, no problems there. And I'm sorry, what was the first part of that question? Um, are there any limits or fluctuations um, on the equipment operations affecting this due to ambient weather temperatures and conditions? Oh, that is a great question. We did operate in temperatures that was um, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And one of the things that we noticed there is that the temperature of the CO2 vapor would be anywhere from about 70 to 75 degrees. When the outside ambient temperature was, uh, we'll say 35 degrees, as the CO2 vapor is going through its hoses to the container, it would cool as well. But we never, the CO2 vapor never got below uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So we were not worried about, you know, freezing the animals, you know, if you will. And let, let me just add to that, you know, these, these animals come in on live haul trailers and these are, you know, have uh, just open vents. And so they're, they're receiving the ambient temperature anyway. So if it's 35 degrees outside, the CO2 vapor is 40 degrees and there's not much of a, a level of induced stress more than what it is from already being uh, transported on the road. Yeah, no, good point. Um, I think that's the end of the question. So um, I'd like to draw this to a close and, and thank you once again, Mike, for, for the presentation and for the clarity of the presentation as well and, um, and the forethought that's going into this area. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Um, so everyone else, uh, we're now going to close this session. Our next session, if you've registered, is going to be the virtual cafe and trivia competition. So if you're interested in that, please register. There's still some time for that. And we've got some prizes to give away. Um, for those of you who are just staying with the straight uh, conference presentations, it's uh, quite a long wait now, seven and a half hours, which is a bit longer than our standard time. Um, so eight o'clock um, p.m. Brisbane time um, is, is the next presentation that's on our list. Um, and that's going to be Superintendent, Superintendent Timothy Minty from um, the RSPCA in the UK talking about reach based animal rescue systems. So if you're able to join us, please do in seven and a half hours time. So thanks once again, Mike, and uh, we'll see you back here again soon.